every single state that has pro-life protections also allows an exception if an abortion is needed to protect the life of the mother. More pro-life legislation goes before the U.S. Supreme Court. Next stop, federal versus state law. Are emergency room doctors required to perform abortions in dire medical circumstances to save a woman's life? A lot of times people think it's because they don't want to work or, you know, are they misusing the system. And assessing the needs of the homeless. Another Supreme Court case might allow the criminalization of people living on the streets. Coming up, expert legal analysis of some important cases to be decided at the end of this court term. I would reflect how God had led me out of coma in that day, but again, there was no direction. And finding truth through tragedy. 25 years after the horror of the Columbine High School massacre, the story of one student's search for God. EWTN News In Depth starts now. Hello and welcome to EWTN News In Depth. The world holds its breath as tensions between Israel and Iran reach an inflection point. Tensions that could spark a wider conflict across the Mideast. On Friday, U.S. officials confirmed Israel carried out a strike inside Iran early that morning. The Iranian news agency says three explosions were heard near an Iranian military base in the Isfahan province. That's where Iran's fleet of American-made F-14 fighter jets are located. The country activated its air defense systems, but the Iranian news agency confirmed the target was not one of Iran's nuclear centers. <laughs> The Israeli strike was in response to this attack last weekend when Iran launched hundreds of ballistics and cruise missiles and bomb-carrying drones toward Israel. It was Iran's first ever direct assault on Israel. Israel's Iron Dome and military coalition led by the U.S., France, Britain and some quiet partners from the Middle East assisted Israel in shooting down the drones and missiles. This map shows where explosions were reported in the sky across Israel. The Iranian missiles targeted the entire country from north to south. No one was reported hurt in either assault, but the back and forth attacks are viewed as a dangerous and aggressive military tit for tat. Iran's massive missile barrage was in retaliation against Israel for an airstrike April 1st in Syria that killed two Iranian generals inside an Iranian consular building. Israel's attack Friday morning, its response. To discuss the escalating tensions between Israel and Iran and the larger dangers that could be posed for this region, we're joined by Andrew Doran. Andrew served on the policy planning staff at the U.S. Department of State and was co-founder of the group In Defense of Christians. He is an Army veteran, attorney, and expert on anti-Semitism and the Middle East. Andrew is a senior fellow at the Philos Project. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. Let's take a step back. We just reported on the Israeli military attack on Iran early on Friday. Friday, a more muted response to what now some are calling a military exercise the week on, weekend of April 13th when Iran struck Israel with significant force. Does it seem that de-escalation is actually possible? Both sides have been characterized as merely threatening with their potential abilities to strike. Thank you, Monse. The, uh, the real uh, more recent history that should be examined here is the last 15 years or so in the Middle East. There has been uh, what the Israelis call shorthand Operation Chess, um, that since the Arab Spring, the beginning of the Syrian civil war, they began a series of quasi-kinetic limited strikes using airstrikes, missile strikes, um, precision guided munition strikes against Iranian and Hezbollah targets in Syria, inside Syria. Uh, Iran's goal is to get missiles, which are very difficult to um, get to Israel across uh, over 2,000 kilometers of terrain uh, without being shot down, much closer. Uh, 
Uh, that's why they want missiles in Gaza. That's why they want missiles in particular in the south of Lebanon. So uh, Syria was um, an opportunity for both sides to establish ground rules, so to speak, for limited engagements. And so instead of a full-blown war like, like we saw in 2006, what we've seen even here between Iran and uh, Hezbollah on one side and Israel on the other are a series of limited strikes with much possibility for escalation. There's a lot of room for, uh, much, much room for escalation on both sides. We haven't really even begun to see what a, what a serious war uh, between these parties would look like. Well, it seems that Hamas and the Palestinian Authority have taken a back seat to what you're describing as this potential escalation. However, prospects of a ceasefire really shouldn't be overlooked. The latest proposal for the release of Israeli hostages, which was put forth by Israel, Qatar, and Egypt, was again rejected. Is there any prospect of a ceasefire now that it would seem that the main Israeli military goal of getting rid of the terrorist leadership has been accomplished? Well, Gaza has always been uh, something of a sideshow. Um, it, it, certainly October 7th was a very serious incursion. It was a terrible uh, terrorist event within uh, Israel's sovereign borders. But Hamas was never the threat that Iran and Hezbollah are, and the threat of a wider regional war would never have begun from Gaza. So as this conflict um, and potentially some brinksmanship diplomacy begins to shift away from Gaza and toward Iran and Hezbollah, you'll begin to see the coalition, that, that the anti-Israel coalition, um, that, especially in the region, that is opposed to uh, what they regard as uh, uh, Israeli, uh, the Israelis going too far militarily to root out Hamas. You'll begin to see that coalition start to look a little bit more complicated because um, the majority of Sunni Islam, uh, the majority of Islam is Sunni, about 85% to 15% Shia. Shia um, interests have been spread across the region by Iran and uh, too often tied to terrorist affiliates like Hezbollah and more recently the Houthis. Um, so the partnership with Hamas was much more tactical. The real, the real um, uh, high stakes uh, war that could be on the horizon is between Israel, Iran, and Hezbollah. The U.S. seems to be playing 3D chess, though, calling for a ceasefire and at the same time vetoing the U.N. resolution this week to give full member state recognition to Palestine. Is the fear of giving recognition driven by some of what you, were, you just mentioned, the actions of Hamas, etc.? Yes, and I, I'm, I'm not at the UN in New York, thankfully, but I can tell you that I, I really doubt uh, that that resolution would have gotten very far if people hadn't been certain that the US was going to veto it. In other words, this is a very cynical play that's very good for headlines. But the, the truth of the matter is, and this is what everyone uh, on the ground knows and understands very well, and in the region they understand this very well. If Israel pulls out of the West Bank, there will immediately be a civil war between Islamic Jihad and Hamas on the one side and the Palestinian Authority on the other. And most of the polls say that in the West Bank, the popular support by a clear majority would go to Islamic Jihad and Hamas over the Palestinian Authority. That's a quaint way of saying that it's the IDF and Israel that keeps the Palestinian Authority in many instances. Um, in a, in a position of authority there. So what does a Palestinian state mean, if not immediate civil war and further destabilizing in the region? Well, we're gonna to continue to monitor this developing story. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. Of course. With heightened tensions in hot spots around the globe, Congress is finally slated to vote on a foreign aid supplemental requested by the White House last October to provide military aid to Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan. Defying pressure from populist conservatives in his own party, Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson says it's time to act. There are precipitating events around the globe that we're all watching very carefully, and we know that the world is watching us to see how we react. Um, we have uh, terrorists and tyrants and terrible leaders around the world like Putin and Xi and, uh, and in Iran, and they're watching to see if America will stand up 
for its allies and in our own interest around the globe, and we will. Instead of one large $95 billion aid bill, Johnson has decided to bring separate bills for each country to the House floor for a vote sometime this weekend. President Biden has pledged to sign the national security legislation immediately. And a Pentagon spokesman said this week the military is poised to start delivering critically needed military armaments to Ukraine within days. We turn our attention next to several important cases about to be argued at the U.S. Supreme Court. Explanation and legal analysis next. The American people know that uh, children of all people are uh, the most vulnerable among us and they deserve protection. Significant news out of the U.S. Supreme Court this week. The justices decided Idaho can enforce its ban on controversial gender transition treatments for minors. For the first time in its history, the Supreme Court weighed in on the controversial issue of what's called gender-affirming care for minors. The Supreme Court's decision means Idaho can enforce its ban while lawsuits proceed, but it does not apply to the two trans-identifying plaintiffs. It reverses a lower court decision and the block of the 2023 law, which subjects physicians to up to a decade of prison time if they provide hormones or puberty blockers to minors. The court's three Democrat-appointed justices dissented. Josh Payne is a founding partner at Campbell Miller Payne, a law firm that specializes in representing D transitioners. He says it's a significant step in protecting minors from gender transition procedures. It's a landmark ruling uh, for the Supreme Court of the United States to step out and give the green light uh, to a state that has restricted uh, so-called gender modification procedures for minors is a watershed moment. It is something that all of the uh, country will pay attention to. More than 20 states have enacted similar legislation that limits gender transition treatments for minors. Next week, the high court will take on another case centered around the state of Idaho and its 2022 law limiting abortion. The justices will determine whether physicians are required under federal law to provide abortions in the emergency room. There's nothing in EMTALA that requires an abortion. In fact, you have to consider the unborn life as being a patient as well. The Supreme Court is gearing up for another abortion battle, this time looking at a case that pits state law against federal law. Idaho versus the United States centers around Idaho's Defense of Life Act, a pro-life law that prevents physicians from performing abortions unless, the law says, it is necessary to save the life of the mother. The Biden administration alleges that this law conflicts with the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act, also known as EMTALA. Congress passed EMTALA in 1986 to require hospitals that participate in Medicare to provide stabilizing treatment to emergency room patients, regardless of their ability to pay. Congress stepped in and said, you can't be dumping patients on other hospitals anymore. The federal law does not mention specific health conditions or procedures, but does mention that physicians must provide stabilizing care for a pregnant woman and her unborn baby. At the very least, you must stabilize a patient and, this is important, and the unborn child. So Congress went out of its way to say there are always two patients at interest with a pregnant woman. In 2022, shortly after the overturning of Roe versus Wade, the Biden administration released new guidance on EMTALA, requiring physicians to perform emergency abortions when necessary to stabilize the mother. The executive order clarifies that when a state law prohibits abortion and does not include an exception for the life of the pregnant person, the state law is preempted. The Biden administration filed its lawsuit against Idaho just months after releasing this guidance. Idaho Attorney General Raul Labrador argues the state's law does not conflict with the federal law whatsoever, emphasizing that the administration's radical interpretation of federal law is nothing more than a reckless disregard for Idaho's right to protect life. U.S. Solicitor General Elizabeth Prelogar says that the state law is narrower than EMTALA and physicians may not provide the necessary care unless and until the patient's condition deteriorates to the point where an abortion is needed to save her life.
We already have the opportunity to perform an abortion if needed. The reality is an abortion is hardly ever needed to save a woman's life. Dr. Um, Ingrid Skop is the vice president and director of medical affairs for the Charlotte Lozier Institute, a pro-life research organization. She's been practicing medicine for more than 30 years and has delivered thousands of babies. She says the addition of abortion in the federal law is unnecessary. Doctors have been practicing under EMTALA since 1986. We've never been confused about when we might need to intervene for a woman to protect her life in pregnancy. Roger Severino, the Heritage Foundation's vice president of domestic policy, served as director of the HHS Office for Civil Rights under the Trump administration. He believes the current administration's changes to EMTALA pose serious risks to the conscience rights of pro-life health professionals. So what is on the table is can you be forcing hospitals and doctors, including Catholic and other religious hospitals, to perform abortions contrary to state law and contrary to moral and religious convictions of these institutions. The Supreme Court will hear oral argument on April 24th. This is the second abortion case the Supreme Court is hearing after it returned the issue of abortion back to the states. We wouldn't be having this discussion if the Biden administration weren't doing everything in its power to twist federal law to impose pro-abortion policies on pro-life states. The first abortion case the high court heard this term concerned the safety of the abortion pill, the most common method of abortion in the United States. In the FDA versus the Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine, pro-life medical doctors allege that the FDA removed important safeguards for mifepristone, the first pill used in a chemical abortion. The FDA, on the other hand, reiterates that the abortion drug is safe for women, citing decades of research that was questioned in oral argument. These cases come at a crucial moment where many are looking at the quickly changing landscape of state abortion laws. In Arizona, Republican state representatives once again shut down discussion on the state's 160-year-old abortion law and attempts to repeal it. This is what we are arguing about right now, whether or not we should overturn something that is archaic. And I would ask everyone in this chamber to respect the fact that some of us have believed that abortion is, in fact, the murder of children. Heated comments on the House floor as Arizona lawmakers scramble over the state's law protecting unborn life from conception. The Arizona Supreme Court ruled last week that the 1864 law is constitutional, giving lawmakers little time to revise or repeal it before it goes into effect. Though a majority of state senators moved the repeal forward, most Republicans in the House blocked it. Those House Republicans show no sign of relenting, despite pressure from some prominent Republicans, including former President Donald Trump, to toss the law because it's seen as a grave political threat in the next election. The overturning of Roe v. Wade leaves abortion in the hands of the states. But how do federal mandates interact with state laws? And how will the Supreme Court's decisions in these cases shape abortion law in states that already protect life? Joining us in studio for legal analysis is attorney Jonathan Berry. He's a former Supreme Court clerk for Justice Samuel Alito. He's now a managing partner at the Boyd and Gray Law Firm in Washington and litigates on issues at the intersection of law, politics, and public policy. Jonathan, great to have you in studio. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Most cases that come to the Supreme Court, as you know, are disputes between state and federal law. In the Idaho case, can federal law supersede a state ban? So there is some power for the federal government to pass laws that, uh, that can override or preempt state laws. Uh, in this case, though, uh, the federal law is very narrow in its preemptive effect. So then theoretically, who wins this dispute? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, so theoretically, um, I, I think if you look at the text of, of the federal law here, it really says that we're going to bend over backwards um, to let state law take its effect. So I, I, I suspect that's how this is going to go. So then the Amtala case is the second one about abortion that the court is considering this term. Do you think the Hippocratic medicine one, the one about mifepristone, will impact the Amtala analysis in any way? I think it. I think the Mifepristone case uh, raises some 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 nearby important issues um, about abortion. Um, but I think with Mtala, we're really looking at the specific language of the of the federal law. 
So then pro-life advocates and lawmakers who have been challenging this EMTALA guidance, this, this is very specific language right around regulations, yes. since it's released nearly two years ago, with this federal agency kind of rewriting the meaning of the regulation. Tell me a little more about whether it's normal for the federal government and its agencies to take these steps. So we're, we're seeing this a lot with this current administration that uh, they'll try to take statutes passed at an earlier time um, and and rewrite them maybe by regulations or by even flyers, handouts, memes, tweets um, to try to, uh, to advance their agenda, sometimes irrespective of what the law actually says. So we've seen that the, Justice Gorsuch in particular is kind of allergic to nationwide applications of certain bans or, or decisions. Yes, that's right. Is, this, is it the case that with this Idaho emergency room reality that we'll only see it be specific to that state or could we see a broader reaching ruling? Uh, I, I think in this case uh, we're likely to see something that is, that's going to be state specific um, mm -hmm. and uh, which is going to fit with the growing sentiment on the court that uh, the lower courts should not be issuing universal injunctions that w range way beyond the particular case. That's interesting, especially since that's where that Mifid Person case came from. Let's switch gears then to the Supreme Court and its um, order on Idaho's ban on gender transition procedures for minors to remain, to remain in place. Uh, do you think that this legal battle is going to shape the way that the court looks at gender transition treatments in the future? Uh, I, I think it's I think it's getting that off to uh, to an interesting start. Um, right now, uh, the Supreme Court has stepped in to say that um, the uh, the preliminary injunction against Idaho's law it's only going to apply to the limited number of individual persons in that case. It's not going to reach other uh, other therapies or, or treatments, and it's not going to reach uh, people who are not part of the lawsuit. So it's very it's very narrow the lawsuit for the moment. Could it then signal what the court might want to do in the future with these controversial treatments that are being banned in Europe? Uh, I think it's I think it's possible. There, there's always in when the Supreme Court makes a decision about uh, temporary relief, about what to kind of how to hold things in place or not while a lawsuit's going on. Um, there's always a little bit of a peek at the merits, a little bit of a preview, um, and I think it's at least suggestive as to where the Supreme Court will go if they end up taking up the full case. Well, that's certainly something we're paying attention to. Jonathan, stay right there. Uh, we have more important Supreme Court discussion ahead that we're going to want to talk to you about. Next, the Supreme Court turns to one of the most consequential cases dealing with the homeless. We talk to advocates for the unhoused and those who say there has got to be a better way to handle this growing problem. You can't make a blanket judgment. If the good Lord judged all of us by our mistakes, that would be quite devastating. We go inside a Catholic agency helping to keep people down on their luck off the streets. As the high court considers a case critics say would criminalize homelessness. What the bishops have to say about that as our analysis of significant cases at the Supreme Court continues. just paying what I could and, uh, you know, struggling. Struggling to pay the rent and provide a home for her family, this Kentucky woman escapes the threat of homelessness through the help of a Catholic relief agency. We turn to the issue of homelessness as a case about people living on the streets in tent encampments will be heard next week at the U.S. Supreme Court. The issue is whether enforcing local laws against tent cities, in effect criminalizing homelessness and arresting unhoused people constitutes cruel and unusual punishment prohibited by the Eighth Amendment. Reporter Mark Irons explains. Who are the people experiencing homelessness? It could be anybody. I never thought it would be me, but here I am. Brianna Humber says her job didn't pay much and she got behind on bills. Soon after, she and her four children were living in a hotel. Five of us crammed in a little one room hotel. They live in Lexington, Kentucky, where this month a state law known as the Safer Kentucky Act passed. Among other criminal justice provisions, the bill outlaws street camping. In cities around the country, some homeless people have resorted to living on the streets in tent encampments. Brianna and her children never had to sleep outside, but they have experienced not having a home. Whenever we're just living in a hotel, 
it's not much space. And whether we like to admit it or not, families are the majority of our those experiencing homelessness in Kentucky. Ginny Ramsey is the director of the Catholic Action Center in Lexington, a place providing food, shelter, and community for the unhoused. She opposes the Kentucky law banning street camping. Ramsey says it will criminalize the homeless and perpetuate an idea that homeless men and women abuse drugs or have criminal backgrounds. And that's false. I mean, there are more criminals and addicts who are housed than those who are not housed. Recent data reported by the Department of Housing and Urban Development shows just 21 percent of individuals experiencing homelessness have reported a serious mental illness. And only 16 percent have reported having a substance use disorder. But some say this data doesn't reveal the full picture of homelessness or focus on particular groups. And when it comes to public policy making, it's time for some new ideas. In Kentucky, you have um, what I would describe as a first step. Devin Kurtz is the public safety uh, policy director for the Cicero Institute. His organization supports the street camping ban in the Kentucky bill, and it has supported similar measures in other states, including Florida. I would say that homeless people are presently suffering and suffering to greater degrees in places that don't enforce this than in places that do. Specifically, the Cicero Institute is looking at the unsheltered homeless population, which includes people who live on the streets. Kurt says data suggests there is a higher percentage of drug abuse within this subsection. Citing a University of California San Francisco study, Kurt says two-thirds of homeless people in the state of California reported regularly using hard narcotics at some point in life, and less than half reported receiving treatment. So he says the chronically homeless live in a bad cycle on the streets. They don't receive the supportive care they need, and they become a vulnerable population ensnared in an environment that invites crime around them. He used Los Angeles as one example. About a quarter of the city's violent crime was connected to a homeless person, either as a victim or as an offender, and oftentimes it's both. This is not about arresting homeless people. To the contrary, it's about helping people get services. Now even more attention will be focused on homeless encampments. The U.S. Supreme Court has taken up the Grants Pass versus Johnson case, stemming from the small city of Grants Pass, Oregon, which also banned camping in public spaces. Gloria Johnson, a homeless woman in Grants Pass, objected to the law. Whatever ruling the court makes could have a major impact. The Johnson versus Grants Pass case is the most impactful case about homelessness in at least 40 years. It will have long-standing repercussions about how states deal with homelessness. Jesse Rabinowitz is the campaign and communications director for the National Homelessness Law Center. The group opposes the Grants Pass camping ban and laws in Kentucky and Florida. He says they won't help people get off the streets. These policies of criminalization make homelessness worse. As we saw in Grants Pass, people were given criminal records because they were homeless. So when they go to apply for a job or apply for an apartment, they're getting rejected. For Advocates like Rabinowitz say the Grants Pass law violates the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution, amounting to cruel and unusual punishment by penalizing people who have nowhere else to go. But punishing people for being poor is not an American value. And in an amicus brief sent to the Supreme Court, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops expressed concern with the Grants Pass law, stating... The Catholic Church, consistent with Western tradition, has long taught that the homeless are to be helped, not punished. It also has long taught that punishments must be proportional to the crimes for which they are imposed. Underlying both teachings is a simple principle, respect for human dignity. The city's punitive laws cannot be squared with this principle. Underlying legislative and legal debates, questions arise like what are the best ways to help those who are unsheltered, keep cities safe, clean, and help communities thrive? Now the state of California is receiving some criticism for its handling of the issue. This month, a state audit found that California spent more than $20 billion to tackle homelessness over the past five years. But where the money went and how effectively it was used isn't entirely clear. And the problem doesn't seem to be improving in many cities. To fix homelessness around the country, Rabinowitz says elected officials could do better. Homelessness is a choice. It is a choice made every day by our elected officials who fail to fund the housing that's needed to end homelessness. But it is not a choice made by people sleeping outside. They are doing the very best they can to survive. But the Cicero Institute is concerned with more permanent forms of government subsidized housing that it says doesn't encourage and incentivize people coming off the streets to stay off drugs. Instead, it hopes more of an emphasis will be placed on a treatment-first approach, which includes temporary housing and services focused on recovery. 
Kurt says public policy around homelessness should demand accountability and shelter without the support of services to address underlying health and wellness concerns could do more harm. It's a really sloppy approach. And, you know, the Grants Pass case is, is one part of allowing communities to take back control of an issue that for too long has been dominated by, by the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development and its funding to community organizations. States really need to play a bigger role. We need more localized solutions. Those who have worked with the homeless for years say keep this in mind. All the, the ways of judgment of a group of folks just because they're unhoused, and they're all different. Everybody's got their own barriers. Everybody's got their own story. For Brianna Humber and her children, it was a local creative community solution that helped the family get out of that crammed hotel room and finally housed. Jenny Ramsey with the Catholic Action Center collaborated with T.C. Johnson. She works with a federal program in public schools that helps students who experience homelessness. It takes the village, so it takes all of us to come together, all denominations, all community agencies. It takes us all to come together to, for one common goal, to ensure that what we are doing is lifting people up and lifting people out. Ramsey and Johnson further collaborated with a small real estate company led by Brian Babbage, who found this home for Brianna's family. He hopes to get more involved in this type of outreach. And figure out ways to help. And we've always wanted to have kind of a charitable arm of the real estate company. And the family is pretty happy too. They now have a place they can call home. Oh, yeah, like, it felt good. Yeah. Yeah, it was like very like joyful. Nice. I wasn't even expecting to receive any help like this. Mark Irons, EWTN News in depth. And we're joined again by legal analyst Jonathan Berry. Let's talk about this homeless case, Grants Pass, Oregon versus Johnson, which will be argued next week at the Supreme Court. A lot of talk about the scope of the Eighth Amendment. What does the Eighth Amendment say? And is this an unprecedented, unprecedented way of looking at cruel and unusual punishment? Well, so the Eighth Amendment forbids uh, the deployment of cruel and unusual punishment. And I think we're going to see a lot of dispute over exactly what, what does that word mean now that the Supreme Court has really turned to focusing on the text of the Constitution. And so what does that word mean, punishment? Uh, what, it, what punishment really refers to, uh, as, best, you know, as best I know, is really the, the consequences, typically the criminal consequences, that get visited um, on someone once a court has found them guilty of some, of some crime or offense. So then how does that apply to grabbing people who are homeless in encampments and arresting them, um, moving them into state facilities? Yeah, so that's going to be, that's really going to be the, the central point of controversy here is um, are, are the actions that are being criticized, that are being criminalized, is this about conduct or is this about status? Is this about simply criminalizing homelessness um, or is it about uh, criminalizing some very specific conduct? Okay. Well, Florida and other states have proposed similar bans to address the growing problem of homelessness. What have the courts said in the past that states are allowed to do? Uh, the states have, um, generally speaking, the states have pretty broad authority uh, to, to deal with these issues. There are, you know, special concern for the human dignity of, of the homeless persons at stake, um, and, as well as uh, sometimes the very serious public safety concerns um, that everyone who lives in that community uh, should be concerned about as well. I know that we've seen that with an uptick in violence in a lot of the U.S. cities that are worried about what is happening with this economy and more people being on the streets Absolutely. Um, and being desperate. Uh, is that then something that the Supreme Court will address or is it just going to address this very, very narrow reality? Uh, I, would, um, I would expect the modern Supreme Court to stay pretty focused on the text of the Constitution. Really the question in this case, Monsi, is does, does this specific uh, municipal law uh, violate this specific prohibition in the Eighth Amendment. Well, let's shift then to a conversation about another amendment. Jonathan, this Saturday marks the 25th anniversary of the mass shooting at Columbine High School in Colorado. Thirteen people were killed when two students opened fire. At the time, it was the deadliest school massacre in American history. And sadly, since that day in 1999, there have been other equally shocking mass shootings at more schools around the nation. The American Medical Association calls gun violence in America a public health crisis. 
We have three gun cases before the court, one on the legality of machine gun conversion devices, uh, one on protections for domestic violence victims, and then the free speech rights of the gun industry. Broadly, how might the court this term shape Second Amendment rights? It's going to be it's going to be a pretty significant term for uh, for these issues, Monty. Uh, I think you're going to see careful attention being paid, especially in that the case that implicates domestic violence issues mm -hmm. of uh, how how much dangerousness uh, needs to be found about a particular person before it's appropriate under the Second Amendment uh, to to strip away some or all of their gun ownership rights to limit that right in some way. It is something yes. we're watching carefully. Well then, how would you characterize seeing this this big change, um, this court term, talking about abortion, transgender rights, homelessness, now we're dealing with guns again, which has been really a thread over the last eight years, eight to 10 years. How would you characterize the Roberts court today? Is it what people expected? <laughs> Uh, I, I think that I think the Roberts Court, uh, in its current incarnation, has been they've been pretty careful. Um, they're they're trying to take a step by step approach on on cases as they as they take them, and then sometimes you see stuff that's really that's really big, like Dobbs um, uh, ending the Roe v. Wade regime. But even there, that was the fruit of a very long um, legal and intellectual campaign for which Dobbs was really just the final step. And quickly, will that be the legacy of Chief, Just, Chief Justice Roberts? Uh, I think it'll be the, the legacy of the Roberts Court. I, I think it may be the legacy of Justice Alito mm. uh, in particular. Um, well, you have a bias there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us in studio, Jonathan. It's Thank great you. to have you here. We just talked about the legal decisions involving guns that will be coming from the Supreme Court. Next, we turn to that heartbreaking event in Columbine 25 years ago. I thought, you know, school shootings was going to end with Columbine. And unfortunately, we've seen school shooting after school shooting. The tragedy that entered this woman's life led her to faith, Catholicism, and life as a religious. Two Catholic faith journeys from that faithful day at Columbine when we return. This is probably the first time in my life I was questioning my faith and I was struggling and I said, God, you know, how, how could you allow this to happen? April 20th, 1999, a school principal reflects on what was at the time the deadliest school shooting in American history as two students opened fire at Columbine High School in Colorado. 25 years ago, the shock of such a brazen and heartless attack in a school of all places shocked America. The death toll and its impact were devastating to the victim's families, the community, and our collective consciousness. But amid the tragedy, there were some unexpected signs of God. Reporter Catherine Hadro joins us with the story of two Catholic faith journeys arising from the horror of that fateful day. Yes, Monse, a quarter of a century later now, the trauma from the Columbine attack remains with the community. Ahead of Saturday's somber anniversary, I spoke with two Catholic Columbine survivors who wrestle with the mourning of the tragic loss of life while also being grateful to God for their own survival. The two suspects appear to have died from self-inflicted gunshot wounds at this time. It was 25 years ago, two Columbine High School students gunned down 12 classmates and a teacher before taking their own lives, shocking the Denver suburb of Littleton and the nation. The Columbine massacre was the deadliest mass shooting at a K through 12 school in U.S. history at the time. Since that tragic day, stories of God's providence amid the evil have emerged. For whatever reason, he saved me that day, and as a result of that, I'm going to try to do his work to the best of my ability. Frank DeAngelis was the principal of Columbine High School the day of the massacre. He vividly remembers his secretary running to tell him reports of a shooting. All of a sudden, I come out of my office, and my worst nightmare becomes a reality because I encounter a gunman coming towards me. The lifelong Catholic says he started praying in his mind, and everything slowed down. He sprinted towards the gunman, avoiding the gunshots, and survived. DeAngelis then focused on getting as many of his students as he could into the gym so they could safely escape to the outside. Everything was going as planned. 
I got the girls to calm down a little bit. They wanted to know what was going on. And I pull on the gymnasium door and it's locked. And all of a sudden, uh, we hear the sounds of the shots getting closer. The gunman's coming around. And I had 30 keys on a key ring. I reached in my suit pocket, stuck the first key that came into my hand, and it opened it on the first try, or I would not be having this conversation. In that same building that very day, another story of what some may call a miracle. Reflecting back, I knew that was something beyond me. Today, she is sister Mary Gianna. But in 1999, she was Columbine High School sophomore, Jenica Thornby. Growing up without any faith, Thornby did not know God, but on that day, she heard him. When I was in high school, I had this habit of going to the library every day during my freshman year and sophomore year. Not one day went by that I did not go to the library, except one day. Uh, the day was April 20th of 1999. I was a sophomore in high school. I was 16 years old. And I was sitting in my art class when all of a sudden I had this overwhelming urge to leave school. I just over in my head kept repeating, there's no way I'm staying here. There's no way that anyone's going to talk me into staying. Thornby convinced her friend to leave campus with her. They could study at a local restaurant instead, she said. And they got into her new car that she had driven to the school for the first time that day. And the moment we turned on the car and started to leave the parking lot, um, and drive away, I looked in my rear view mirror and noticed hundreds and hundreds of schoolmates of mine just running out of the school. And we had no idea what had happened. Uh, we thought maybe it was a fire drill, but we didn't understand like why, but why were kids running? The news began to unfold and soon after Thornby would learn that 10 out of the 12 Columbine students who died, died in the library. She overheard an adult say that God must have a plan for her life. That was like putting the pieces together. Like I had this urge to leave. God has a plan for my life. And so I did bring that to God after I found faith. You know, why did why did you allow me to survive? And I felt like God said to me, like, you know, I love you so much that even in this life, I want you to, you know, you know, to know me, not, not only in heaven, but even in this life. Thornby says God called her out of Columbine and God called her to himself. She now sees the tragic events at her high school as the springboard for her faith life. A year later at 17, a friend invited Thornby to the local Catholic church. And at 18, she was invited to adoration. She didn't tell me where we were going, but I walked into that chapel and I felt the presence of God. So I ended up going to Franciscan University where I was immersed in the Catholic faith. And it was the Easter vigil. I was 19 years old. It was March 30th of 2002. Uh, I became Catholic. After graduating from college, Thornby spent time as a missionary and continued to process the trauma from her youth. I picked up a book by Father Benedict Rochelle, and he said, instead of asking God why something happened, ask God what would you have me do? And so instead of reflecting on my life, why did this happen or that happen? Why did the shootings happen? I started to pray and ask God, okay, what would you have me do? And immediately I had this desire to sell everything I had and follow Jesus. And with this desire came the words, I just want to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ and follow him. And that's what she did, eventually discerning to become a religious sister with the Disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, based in Prairtown, Texas. Though the stories of survival are remarkable, these two Catholics who were at Columbine tell us they grapple with their survival. My spiritual director at one point said it was God's permissive will to allow that to happen, but it was his deliberate will to lead me out of school that day. Principal DeAngelis says he had his first crisis of faith the night of the attack, but soon after a priest friend called him to the church and shared a spiritual insight. He said, Frank, you should have died that day, but God's got a plan. And he quoted Proverbs 16, 9. He said, in his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. And he said, you're going to have to go rebuild this community and help others. In the wake of the tragedy, the beloved principal, who had to be strong for others, says he began his mornings with spiritual and scripture readings, but especially leaned on adoration during his many restless nights. Some of my most empowering things for me is when I would be in that adoration chapel just by myself and have a conversation as we're having right now and say, Jesus, just show me the way. Every day, 
before my feet hit the ground, I recite the names of my beloved 13. They give me the faith and the power to continue because I state I refuse to be helpless, I refuse to be hopeless, and I refuse to give in. Sister Mary Gianna tells me she thought Columbine would be the last school shooting of its kind. She says what gives her hope when looking at the magnitude of school violence today is knowing, okay, I can do my part. I can choose to respond to God's calling in my life. No major events are planned Saturday for the 25th anniversary, but it is expected. People will leave flowers at the memorial near the high school and others will attend a candlelight vigil on the steps of the Colorado State Capitol Friday night. Well, Catherine, it's so powerful to hear both of these stories. How did you see God within this tragedy? Well, you, you said it right there. God was within that tragedy. We know that evil was present on that campus, but both of these survivors remind me that the hand of God was there. Principal DeAngelis reminded me, you know, this, this was a horrible massacre. The gunmen intended it to be even more deadly. They planted bombs on the campus, bombs that never went off, which spared hundreds of more lives. So we know these hidden miracles with these two, but there are countless other miracles we don't even know about that took place on that campus. Well, you sure have your work cut out for you there. Mm -hmm. But tell me a little bit more about Principal DeAngelis. You said this was the first time he was able to actually talk about his faith. Yes, I mean, he is in the media often because he was this major figure when it came to the Columbine massacre. And he's obviously a man of faith. He had been an usher for 20 years at his wow. parish ahead of this tragedy. Um, and he made a pledge after the Columbine massacre that he would stay on as principal until every child in that school system, kindergarten on up, graduated from high school. So he retired in 2014. He tells me, you know, I, I thought I lost my calling as a Catholic mm. school teacher because my faith is so important to me, but then his friend pointed out to him, he can be a witness to Christ in that Columbine community to people who otherwise may not have known the Lord. No, absolutely. Well, it's the same then with Sister Mary Gianna, mm -hmm. who was talking about this as the springboard for her faith. What other details can you share about her vocation? So something else that struck me, her name when she became a religious sister is Sister Mary Gianna. Obviously after Our Lady and St. Yeah. Gianna Baretamala, as it happens, St. Gianna Baretamala went into labor on April 20th, wow. days before her death. So Sister Mary Gianna feels this special connection with St. Gianna about that date. And just as St. Gianna is this great pro-life saint, Sister Mary Gianna wants to build up this culture of life in response to a culture of death that we saw on full display on Columbine that day. Absolutely. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for this report and for coming in to share more with us. It's my honor. Thank you. We continue now with some headlines in The Week in Review. Results of an investigation released this week indicate the deadliest wildfire in U.S. history. The fire in Maui last August was exacerbated by poor communication, high winds, and a lack of adequate preparation. 101 people died after a power line fell, sparking an initial blaze that rapidly spread through a wide area. The report says a broad communications breakdown left some authorities in the dark and residents without emergency alerts to evacuate. The Hawaiian Electric Company did not confirm fallen power lines were de-energized until well after the flames had caused widespread damage. And despite the heroism of individual firefighters, the Maui Fire Department was overwhelmed, understaffed and unprepared following weather warnings days before about extreme risk of wildfire due to high winds. The Hawaii Attorney General released the report, a first in a multi-phase probe into how and why the fire turned so catastrophic. A report now on the newest members of America's Catholic priesthood, scheduled to be ordained in 2024. The statistical snapshot is gathered annually by Georgetown University's Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate, or CARA. This year, CARA says more than half of the newly ordained priests will be aged 31 or younger. Just over two-thirds of them are Caucasian. 18% are Hispanic, 11% are Asian Pacific Islander, and 2% are Black or African American. About three-quarters of the new ordinands in the United States were born here. After the U.S., the most common countries of birth are 5% from Mexico, 4% from Vietnam, 3% from Colombia, and 2% from the Philippines. In discerning their vocation to the priesthood, Cara says almost 30% had the example of a relative who was a priest or religious.
service. 89% were encouraged to consider the priesthood from someone in their life. 82% said both of their parents were Catholic when they were children. 71% said they were altar servers before entering the seminary. And 28% said they participated in Boy Scouts. About 470, 475 new priests are expected to be ordained this year in the United States. Our congratulations and prayers to the class of 2024. One of America's most famous young Catholics is embarking on the next chapter of her life. The Indiana Fever select Caitlin Clark, University of Iowa. Iowa basketball superstar Caitlin Clark was taken number one in the WNBA draft on Monday by the Indiana Fever. The all-time leading scorer in NCAA Division I basketball now officially goes professional. Long before she was shattering records as a player at the University of Iowa, Caitlin was a standout star at Dowling Catholic High School in West Des Moines, Iowa. This week, her high school basketball coach told EWTN News Nightly that Caitlin's Catholic faith always played a part in her game. Caitlin is the type of person who it's always been important for her to maximize her God-given talents and to share those with the world. She knows that that her, her some of her gifts from God are not only her athleticism, but her ability to entertain. And so I think she really just tries to maximize those gifts and share those with the world through the sport of basketball. Headlining the player that has captured fans' hearts Across America, the Indiana Fever will likely be one of the hottest tickets this basketball season. And a moment for celebration. This Saturday marks the 101st birthday of Mother Mary Angelica of the Annunciation, the foundress of EWTN. Mother Angelica was born Rita Rizzo on April 20, 1923, in Canton, Ohio. After a miraculous healing of her abdomen in her teens, Mother felt a call to religious life and soon joined the Poor Clares. In 1981, she founded the Eternal Word Television Network in Irondale, Alabama. Today, her network reaches more than 260 million households across the globe. She passed away on Easter Sunday, 2016. We remember her for her tenacious wit, her joyful spirit, and above all, her faith in God. Please join us in celebrating the life of Mother Angelica this weekend and praying for the repose of her soul. Next, progress in the restoration of one of the most famous Catholic cathedrals in the world. Five years after that devastating fire in Paris, information about the reopening of the Notre Dame. This week marks the fifth anniversary of that massive fire that ravaged Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Renowned as a home to relics, stained glass, and invaluable works of art, the 12th century Catholic Church is set to reopen in December after years of painstaking work to rebuild it to its original grandeur. A look now at Notre Dame Cathedral's road to restoration. April 15, 2019. A stunned world watched as flames destroyed one of Our Lady's most iconic cathedrals. Though the pictures showed a raging ball of fire, no one was killed. Investigators believe the fire was sparked by either a cigarette or a short in the electrical system. To the relief of many, French President Emmanuel Macron immediately vowed to rebuild the Gothic masterpiece. Because I was born in Paris like my husband, we have childhood memories from this place, so it was hard. It was like seeing all the history of our ancestors that built it being shattered. Since then, more than 250 companies and hundreds of craftsmen, architects and construction workers have labored to save Notre Dame at a cost of more than $900 million in donations. Restoration included the removal of tons of debris and a decontamination of the area from toxic dust and lead. 
Then an army of construction workers strengthened damaged towers and walls. Master glassmakers and other artisans cleaned and restored stained glass. And in a nod to modern safety technology, a new fire prevention system has been installed. Today, visitors to Paris flock to the cathedral to check on the renovation and to see an exhibit explaining the intricate processes used to restore the cathedral to its medieval glory. We've been walking around uh, looking at the exhibition of the restoration and the um, attention to the detail of the medieval construction and how where they get the timbers and, and uh, the uh, specific medieval um, construction techniques they've used to restore. One of the biggest moments of the renovation happened in February of this year, when scaffolding on the cathedral's new spire was removed, providing a clear view of the golden rooster and cross at its top. Notre Dame Cathedral's expected reopening is scheduled for December 8th, following the Paris Olympic Games this summer. And that does it for this edition of EWTN News In-Depth. I'm Monse Alvarado. Next week, an encore presentation of an in-depth special report on the seven Catholic sacraments. A good reminder for us all as we enter confirmation season and focus on the real presence of the Eucharist during the upcoming National Eucharistic Congress. We hope you'll tune in. Until then, God bless.